In this lecture, I hope that you will not only think about how to create maps and the motivation to do so, but also rethink how you perceive space and how you can represent that space. In Up, Across, and Along, a selection from Ingold's book on lines, he describes how gestures, movement, and travel can be represented by lines. Further, he discusses how this line has been fragmented by modernity, what he calls wayfaring has been replaced by transit, the drawn sketch replaced by the route plan. He posits that people who live in metropolitan societies have increasingly conceived of their environments as assemblies of connected elements. This is important in a discussion of archaeological mapping because people do not always think of moving through space in the way that we now see represented on maps. If people do not think of their environments in a way that can be circumscribed, should we be using current British mapping standards to document their environment? Is there a way we can think about the environment that allows some access to how past people may have understood space? Perhaps not, but through the examples I show in this, this lecture and the following lectures, I want to encourage you to think creatively about maps and mapping through several examples. Ingle describes wayfaring evocatively, citing the Inuit as an example. As soon as a person moves, he becomes a line. You lay one set of tracks, looking for other tracks that may lead you to your quarry. The countryside is a mesh of interweaving lines rather than a continuous surface. The Inuit moves through the world along lines of travel. For wayfarers, the act of traveling to a particular location plays a part in defining who the traveler is. On the route you may look for, say, fruiting trees, other edibles, so life happens while traveling. So as Ingold says, the wayfarer is continually on the move, more strictly he or they or she, is their movement. I like to use this example of maps um, made by Inuit people that are carved out of wood. As you see, they're very tactile and that you would hold this map in your hand while you tried to navigate the coastline. Ingold contrasts wayfaring with transport, where each destination is a point of re-entry into a world from which they have been temporarily exiled while in transit. You move from point A to point B to point C without necessarily thinking a lot about the journey in between those points. As Ingold says, unlike wayfaring or seafaring, transport is destination-oriented. It is not so much a development along a way of life as carrying a cross from location to location of people and goods in such a way as to leave their basic natures unaffected. Arguably, you are not affected as you enter the plane and go to France, and so you're moving from point A to point B. Yet people can integrate both methods into their lifestyles. Ingold mentions the Orochon, also called the Evenks, people of north-central Sakhalin, who hunt wild reindeer. While hunting, they leave the kill where it lies to be retrieved later, so meandering or wayfaring this way and that back to the camp. But when they come back with the sledge, eventually, to collect the kill, they drive directly to the site where the carcass has been cached. Or, honestly, these days they take their snowmobiles. So you see, um, this is actually a reindeer race that is not somebody hurrying on their way to collect their carcass. So it is not just the mode of transportation that turns wayfaring into transport. Ingold also cites Australian Western Desert Aboriginal people who have turned their car into a wayfaring device where cars are driven gesturally. This is similar to what I've found, actually, while doing archaeological work in Qatar, where the giant SUVs are maneuvering around rocks and sabka, basically sinking sand and other landscape features. So transport makes the traveler a passenger who has moved from place to place without the journey having much of an impact. But how do we capture these ideas within a map? Ingold notes the roads converging on Duroprave, one of the industrial centers during the Roman occupation of Britain. These are transport roads that cut across the landscape and are not interested in the meandering rivers, hills, or heaths surrounding the center. So if wayfaring, as Ingold seems to imply, is the most fundamental node by which living beings inhabit the earth, how again do we capture wayfaring within a map? And, as Ingold says, the vast majority of maps that have ever been drawn by human beings have scarcely survived the immediate context of the production. 
I like to use this example, a map on a hand, a hand-drawn map on a hand, to show that many maps exist within the realm of storytelling. You may give directions to a friend by drawing an extemporaneous map. You may augment this map by pointing and scribing space with your fingers. This map is a map made out of chalk, inscribed perhaps on one of the streets within the map. It is ephemeral, perhaps a play map, with some important streets named, others going unnamed to be passed by, then washed away after the next rain. This is a map of Diban, an Iron Age tell in Jordan, where I spent a couple of summers excavating. The map, as you see, is back to front, with north on the bottom, only indicated by the direction of a sunset. The distances are inaccurate, but it describes some of the sensorial delights of walking up a very steep hill, although you can't tell because I didn't put hashir marks on it, in 40 degree heat. You see the annotation of the goats. You see that we might go by a bicycle game or be stared at at a fruit stand by men. So this map shows an experience of a space, of a space that we inhabited while we we're excavating in Diban in Jordan. And these are Micronesian coconut leaf rib maps that trace the intersecting courses of ocean swells. The meaning of the map is routes and intersections. Think about the different perception of space as played out within this map. How would a Neolithic person create a map of their area? Would it be different or similar to a Mesolithic person? Would they think be thinking about maps at all? How would they describe their journeys to their fellow people? While ethnographic analogy is really dubious at best, I hope these maps and the ones I'll be showing you in a later lecture open your mind to different ways to describe space. And these are different ways than, say, this one. Now, instead of drawing maps, we often just drop a pin so our friends can meet us at the pub or by the riverside. Even this map, made in Digimaps, might look a little bit strange to you as we are so visually circumscribed by Google Maps these days. Can you pick out King's Manor, the walls, the museum gardens? Which part of this map would be unnecessary in your daily experience? How do you move through space? Headphones in, head down, trying to make your transport as quick as possible? Or do you allow yourself to wander, to explore, to try to vary your routes? Do you make a journey of it? Do you do any wayfaring?